So, in this post-COVID era, and I and I think I flicked you my my one of my last articles where I where I sort of went around on a bit of a meander around, like I do, uh, about certain industry issues. Um, and I, but if you if you sum up that the belief that yeah we need to do uh, the construction industry needs to act and behave differently, regulation the regulators need to need to act and behave differently, and and probably try to mould consensus rather than be an arbiter from the from the top down in terms of we're going to we're going to introduce this and we're going to do that. Um, do you think I noticed that the UK is seemingly embarrassing this softer let's work it out sort of conciliatory approach uh, in COVID. I'm hoping that it's not just going to be a COVID thing, that it will stay with us. One of these, you know, um, one of these good, con if I can say good consequences out of COVID, that it will realise that the old, the, the ways in which we've just, everyone's just marched to their corners and, and drawn their swords and come out fighting way too, too, too quick. That can't be the case in COVID because who's going to have us stash of money anyway to, to pay for everybody for, for this sort of stuff? That's the difficulty. Australia's not been in recession for 29 years. Um, mm. And we worked in London in the global financial crisis. And the department in my law firm, we, we had so many different departments uh, across six storeys in a building opposite the Tower of London. The department that was most busy was the dispute resolution and litigation department. So what I learned from the GFC and practising in London was that every penny mattered. People thought about small things, whereas in a boom time, they will walk away and seek the next opportunity. Mm -hmm. In a crunch time, they look back and mm -hmm. they say, I, I got done over and I'm not going to let that sit. What are my options? So I think we're going to see um, the disputes increase. Does that mean that we have to be confrontational and contentious? I believe not. I believe the best way to conduct disputes is with the collegiality. Mm. Whenever I come to Brisbane, which I do often, if we're in court, the silks who most often lead me will say, can you pick up the phone and speak to the junior on the other side? And it is the best thing. And, and it, you know, it should happen it should happen in the construction context when they're on site. It should happen on all of those projects and just try to keep an open communication happening because that's where you find the common ground. And once you narrow your issues, you don't come with 20, you come with three and you know how pivotal they are and you know what happens if you win on one. You know, you can do that full decision-making tree down so, so that the client is really well across what will happen if you win or lose on one of those three remaining pivotal issues. Um, does it sound like a spirit of mutual trust and cooperation? Like that partnering ethos? Mm. But each of us as humans, I think, can choose to do that. Yeah. yeah we've got choices. But at the moment, I heard, so and this is not a political statement, but I heard something our PM say the other day about trying to best describe the changes he's made to COAG, you know, moving away from the COA concept into the National Cabinet Conference. And he said he always found the best outcomes would be achieved in the social gatherings the night before COAG <laughs> rather than the, the COAG when the room was full of all the bureaucrats and everyone had their, had their you know, formal, formal stuff on. So that's, yeah, that's saying, once again, the same thing that we're sort of saying here. It comes with issues. I'm not saying it's, you know, but it, a cabinet working like that is built on relationships. It's based on confidentiality. You know, you, you do all those sorts of things. But, yeah, he said, I thought, well, what a damning indictment of what's been going on for the last 15 years. If the best thing is the drinks and the, and the nibbles the night before, <laughs> why didn't we just go cut straight to the drinks and the nibbles and forget the, all the, all the hoo-ha for the next couple of days? Cabinet would be up in arms paying for drinks and nibbles. Um, but I think, they, I think compromise is the other the other word that gets thrown in there and you know compromise doesn't just happen at the beginning where you're negotiating a construction contract compromise happens all the way along yeah and it gives you certainty so that if you've got an extension of time application and you're for the payee then you you could compromise that from a 20 to a 10 week claim but actually lock it in and 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 know then 
that you can agree a new program and, and work forward with some certainty, carve out your assumptions and exclusions, and you know, try to move forward in a way that, particularly on a long, complex infrastructure project, doesn't mean that at the end of the day, when people like us get involved and we say, show us your program, they go, oh, well, we had one, and um, 36 months ago, we'd never agreed one. Oh, what were you building to? It's, it's one of the things that I always used to get frustrated was people would look at adjudication from purely from the perspective of the number of adjudication applications lodged mm. as, as if it's meant to be a success or failure. And it always used to annoy me because um, the, 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 times, if, if the times I saw adjudication work the best was when, okay, a relationship had broken down. Let's say it broke down very early in the piece. But somehow they they got through progress claim two, three, four, five, six, you know. Each of those progress claims getting haircuts, if I'm calling it. But the contractor chose, a, you need the, you know, the means to do it, but the contractor chose not to go to adjudication on each one of those progress claims. He, he waited to the end. Yeah. Um, so, so instead of having 10 adjudications, which would have been a war all the way through, got through to the end, cash came through the project, and, yeah, they had a big barney at the end. But if you're going to have a barney, it's best to be at the end rather than, you know, all the way through. So, and I used to think, well, that's a good outcome. But, you know, from a statistical point of view, it probably would look better if there had been 10 adjudications. I think it also depends on, don't you hate it when lawyers say this, facts and circumstances of every case, because mm. there are some... Uh, construction contracts where it goes so wrong so early and if you're the one not getting paid it's not a commercial option to do the final account dispute it's actually well in your interests to have these things ventilated early on yeah. Um, and yeah we I think one of the most fascinating things I was ever involved in was on that Channel Tunnel Rail Link case um, where <laughs> I flew in from New York. It all sounds so exotic, London. <laughs> I flew in from New York on the red eye and I got to work and my boss said to me, corporate espionage. I was like, yes, what about it? She's like, we've got a spy. Somebody has sat in a meeting. Wow. And in the way, the top commercial information from that meeting given it to the other side. I was like, how do you know? I've got an affidavit. They're bringing an injunction in the high court personally naming the project director uh, and accusing him of the tort of procuring a breach of contract because he apparently sat in a meeting and said, don't pay them any money. Go find me my mole. And I went, oh, my gosh, okay, this is very exciting. And I was like, yeah, who said construction law is not sexy? No one on this call. Um, and I was given a list and I was told to work from Z up and my colleague was working from A to M and we were going to meet in the middle. And I, I had my set questions and I asked them all and I got through 30 or 40 attendees. There were 100 people at that meeting. And they were all saying the same thing. That is not what the project director said. He said, we signed an NEC contract. Yes, we've got a partnering ethos, but we need the accounts and records from the contractor to justify the amounts that they are seeking to be paid. Mm -hmm. And where they're not there, because we're spending public money, we can't justify paying in those circumstances. It's like, okay, this is very interesting. And then got to a man who said, yeah, that's what he said. <laughs> where are you? And he said, I'm at my desk. And we were all working in like this three-story porter cabin. It was extremely sophisticated. And I said, don't move. I'm running to you. He said, okay. And I'm on the phone talking to my boss. I've got him. I've got them all. And I turn up and there are literally pieces of paper flying in the air as I arrive. And I say to the guy at the next desk, where's, where's the guy? Family emergencies had to... <laughs> And they, they had actually got him to sign a witness statement, an, an affidavit that was going to be used in the High Court um, to support this thing. But, you know, 99 other people said that wasn't what the project director said. 
But it was really important. I understand why when they had that person say that thing, and which is what he heard, you know, he heard yeah. something from what everybody else heard, but he heard that. That allowed that contractor to put a lot of commercial pressure on. And it's a great case. It's called uh, Bechtel, Bechtel and Basili. Mr. Fady Basili was our project director and he was personally named in the High Court of England and it was a bunch of um, really big international um, constructors who joined a, a joint venture and they had instructed a, a very um, aggressive law firm on their instructions to bring this really aggressive injunction, which was denied. Whew. 